My name is Ben Brown. Um, I changed the talk uh, kind of title on the fly. It used to be mass scale flexible indexing, which I think is probably the worst ordering of words I could have possibly done. So I uh, changed it up to flexible indexing at scale, which I think sounds a lot nicer. Um, so who I am, I'm a software architect um, at the Cerner Corporation. We're a healthcare IT company, um, fairly large, one of the biggest ones in the United States. 12,000 people worldwide with thousands of clients. Uh, and we do a lot of our own data center stuff. So inside Cerner hosted systems, uh, which means we host them inside our own data center, it represents about 20% of the beds uh, in the United States uh, and some in Canada and in Mexico and around the continent. And then ones is overseas as well, but those are in separate data centers. So um, what my team does is Semantic Solutions. Uh, we're about 10 people. We write search services for people building stuff out inside the cloud, inside the Cerner data centers. Um, so if a team needs you know, patient search or providers or schedules and stuff like that, they kind of get in touch with us. So while we're doing all this, we get to do lots of fun things on top of it. So we get to do NLP, um, work with medical ontologies, which are very rich um, and complex and interesting at the same time. And so we get to do a lot of that kind of markup on our documents and a lot of machine learning as well. So we take a lot of activity data and build out new reference data sets that we then build search services on top of. So kind of where we got started uh, with kind of our flagship kind of product that our team does uh, is chart search. And so the idea was we'd be taking the patient record and turning it from something like this that you all might have seen at some point in time, a three ring binder that's, you know, you set it down at a desk and it makes a gigantic thump. <laughs> And you know they might have marks all over and stuff like that, but at the same time, it's pretty much completely unusable, findable, anything like that. And so we take that and turn it into this. So your typical search metaphor, you know, you've got a box up at the top. You can type stuff in. It's got facets um, along the side there, date ranges. Overall, much more usable. And you can kind of see the slides a bit fuzzy, um, but some of the smarts that we do around it is you can search for things like lipid profiles, and it'll find LDLs, HDLs, uh, you know, those more generic things you might be aware of from your cholesterol readings, as well as drugs and things like that that might be mentioned inside documents. So with all that faceting, the NLP, the semantic concept markup inside it, it makes for a really heavy record, especially when we got started and we were working with Solar 1.4. So we started to worry about scale, and we kind of began the major engineering efforts. We've prototyped and stuff like that before 2009. Um, but in 2009, we really started those major engineering efforts. So when we were kind of worrying about like, you know, we're gonna have all this data that we know about, how are we gonna work with it? And found this article um, by Grant Ingersoll, he's back there. <laughs> so in the IBM Developer Works, where he was talking about a lot of the new features in SolarJ, and he kind of had this, this diagram of what a distributed index could look like. And so you hash out you know, your documents over your shards, very traditional kind of thing. And then you distribute your queries across it. And we just kind of ran with it. And the really important part there that we kind of saw was, oh, it's one to n shards. So that'll be great for us. You know, n is a big number, it could be. So you know, naively, we just kind of jumped into it. So, Scale-wise, um, we decided to partition by clients. Um, we ended up giving chart search away for free to all our clients. So we knew there were gonna be a lot of them. Uh, we have about 150 clients on the system right now. And that represents about 140 billion discrete results and 15 billion medical documents. So lots of stuff. <laughs> uh, we keep all that raw and processed data inside HDFS, uh, which amounts to about a petabyte raw right now and about a petabyte and a half process data. Um, so we've got some really big problems in that area. But working that out to shard size, our real limiting factor was about 26 million discrete results per shard with all the facets we were doing. And if you're really good at the head math, I had to use a calculator for this. That's about 35 shards per client. Um, but obviously every client is a unique snowflake and those range from about five shards per client 
all the way up to 140. So that's where it really gets crazy. Um, and kind of in that, that distributed system kind of, or distributed index, what you don't really get in that original slide is how the routes go for the queries that you end up running. So you get that user query that comes in the top, goes through the top level load balancer, it's the black line in this diagram, um, ends up going out to a random shard, just landing, and that shard ends up being kind of the coordinator for the process. And then it reissues the query out to each specific shard. Uh, usually if you wanna do it you know, as redundant as possible, you go back up to that top level load balancer with maybe some context in play. Um, and so it routes out to all of them, collects all the results back and sends it back up. So if you're going to talk to each of your shards in that traditional kind of system where you have, you know, where you have everything spread out across all the shards, you're gonna be having a lot of touch points. So one user action from our app's perspective amounts to about four queries that go out to solar. So for 35 shards, you're at about 432 touch points. For 140 shards, you're up at 1700, which is crazy. Surprisingly, it works. So, but it's not efficient at all. Uh, and you really have that chance for variance in each of those touch points. So if you have a shard that's garbage collecting, it'll slow things down. Um, or, you know, the load balancers usually are great. Um, they're not as much of a problem, but they're still a configuration point. So if you have a master that goes, drops out, or you want to um, promote a replica back up, back in the solar uh, kind of one four days, you really had to go through and reconfigure everything at all those points, which was not fun. So what about the kind of growth angle? The hashed ID um, does not play well with resizing. So this is something that's been kind of a constant problem inside the solar space. And, you know, inside the solar cloud, kind of 4.3 features is really getting fixed up quite a bit. Um, but that, that traditional problem was, you know, you redeploy again into a new cluster, and then you re-index everything. And when you're talking about two billion discrete results on a client level, my conversations with ops usually go like this. And I turn to them and I say, you know, hey, operations, and they say, yes, Ben. And I say, can you deploy me a new cluster make it a little bit bigger for this client, uh, re-index all the data in the system, make sure real-time updates are applied to both of them so we don't take a downtime, and by the way, don't make it too big, although we will need to resize them again, because making it too big slows them down even more and just costs more money. And they kind of look at me with a blank stare, and then I kind of apologize a lot. <laughs> so that's that usual conversation. So clearly we've got a problem. Um, growth is extremely painful, lots of redeployments, lots of risk due to all that variance, and so Snidely Whiplash is, you know, rubbing his hands inside the system every day, waiting for something to go wrong and make life miserable. So what would be better? Load balancing the client would be great. Those are a lot of deployments and load balancers configuration that we don't have to do. Automated failover would be great, so if a machine goes down, we don't have to promote a new uh, master, reconfigure stuff. Uh, easy deployments, that'd be cool too. Uh, we do a lot more than just chart search. So if we're deploying a new, you know, a new concept for a different team, if we didn't have to make that onerous to do that, that'd be super cool. <laughs> Simplified splitting would be great. So you know, when you get into that growth scenario, if that's really easy, that makes you know, operations life much, much better. Minimizing the touch points to decrease that variance would also be great. And really disconnecting the stages in our workflow, so between crawling and processing and indexing and all that kind of stuff. If you disconnect those stages, it really makes it easier for you. So maybe you can process your documents without sending them to, a, or to the indexes at the time. So kind of where we went from a solution perspective is we shifted the master into HBase. So what does this kind of mean? You know, obviously, you know, taking Yoda and putting them inside HBase is all well and dandy, but it doesn't mean too much. So we thought about running coprocessors uh, with the solar instances inside them, decided not to go that way. So what we really ended up doing 
was on a per row basis. Each row corresponds to a single solar document. So when we do our indexing kind of processing, that solar document just gets dropped inside HBase. So why did we end up choosing HBase? Uh, lexically organized keys is gonna be great for us so we can organize our data in a way that really makes sense. So you know, group patients together, that kind of stuff. Um, those key range scans, so if you go from one key to another, those are gonna be incredibly efficient from an HBase perspective, so reading all that data back out. And also the time-based scans are very efficient as well. So if you wanted everything <coughs> that occurred since five minutes ago, that kind of operation is almost entirely in memory and will respond very, very fast. And we're pretty decent at operating at this point, so we use it in a lot of other uh, solutions. So Ops knows what it is. They know how to do da disaster recovery on it. Um, and, you know, it's already there. It's ready infrastructure for it. So what about coordination? Um, of course, everybody turns to Zookeeper. It's the right choice almost all the time. <laughs> So we kind of built out uh, this structure where we have, and I'll go back over this with some pictures at a later time. Um, so if it doesn't make sense now, just wait a little bit. Uh, we've got the index name, a version of the index, and then we attach things like table name, connection info, uh, the schema and config uh, for those solar instances. Shards, their boundaries that they kind of capture on top of HBase, which sounds abstract right now. Uh, but the next slides will make that a little more clear. Replica numbers, and then we use a lot of ephemeral nodes for kind of the real connection processes. So when you claim something, it creates ephemeral node, says where to connect to it at. And of course, we had to plug all this into solar, so we just wrote a custom core admin. Um, works with Zookeeper for that claim process and uh, pulls data back from HBase. So what does this claim process look like? So we've kind of got this pool of totally symmetric machines out on the side. So we can deploy hundreds of them, thousands of them if we need to. They're all the same, uh, very commodity hardware. And then you kind of have this index table that you've built up in HBase so that it has those solar docks in it. And you can see we've partitioned this one um, into three shards. So we have A to H, H to P, P to Z. So you begin the claim process, and what does that kind of look like? I like to liken it to hungry, hungry hippos. <laughs> so you have all these replicas that are out there just waiting for stuff, and they're kind of all just chomping at the bit, kind of trying to go out there, grab as many marbles as they can to host those replicas and bring them online. Um, we're a little bit smarter than the kids, you know, playing hungry, hungry hippos. Uh, we're aware of which node things are running on, so you don't have two replicas for the same shard on the same node. And we can add other stuff as well. So like if the machine is performing poorly or it's running low on RAM, then we can decide not to host it there. And rack awareness as well. So that claim process begins, and we've got our, our kind of set of winners out there, and they're racing out onto those version zero replicas. And they begin to pull back their data out of HBase. So they do that process and they just start scanning, which is that incredibly efficient operation. We've parallelized it here a little bit. Um, so it's not like one worker process is bringing up the entire table. And as they finish pulling that data back and making sure that they're up to date and current with real time, uh, they bring themselves online. So that's creating that other ephemeral node that says, yes, you can search me now. Uh, overall, this table isn't fully represented at this point. So you wait a little bit longer and the rest of the uh, replicas, finish coming online, and then you're good. So you might have noticed that that one in the middle there took a while to go, and obviously it's representing a much larger region on the table. That one might not perform so well. It'd be great if we could just split it. So that's kind of where the biggest thing that we want in the system comes from. So you can just say, you know, it'd be great if I had, you know, a region from H to K and K to P instead of that big slice and you create a new version. So those top one, the top one and the bottom one, were already representing that range of keys. None of that's changed. So they can just migrate straight over and serve that same purpose on both versions. The one in the middle, though, goes through that same process. They start fighting for it and eventually claim those two new shards in the middle 
go back through the same process, pull data out of HBase, get all the data, mark themselves online. So that's as simple as the splitting process is. It looks just like the original process of creating an index. So now we don't have a need for version zero anymore. So I go out there and delete it. Obviously the top and bottom one um, migrated. So they're gonna stay out there, keep hosting those regions, keep pulling the data, stay up to date. The old shard though isn't needed anymore. So it's served its purpose and it can just take itself back to the pool. So that's great, that's normal operation. We've handled splitting. What about failure? So your hippo rises up, you know, out of the river and eats one of your shards, <laughs> which, you know, seems to be the best explanation for sometimes when things go wrong. And, you know, the dog ate it kind of thing. So it eats the shard, uh, it's gone. And due to kind of the ephemeral nature of the node that we're using, you know, that process is no longer hitting back to Zookeeper and it just looks like it isn't claimed at this point, which goes back to the same old process. The instance pools are constantly looking for open places to go claim stuff from. So it can just start working its way across, pull data down, and bring it online, just like a normal process. So tying kind of this diagram together uh, with the Zookeeper node information, you can kind of see the version up there at the top um, the different shards and the two boundaries that they're pointing to. So that's to the H and K area. Uh, ephemeral claim means that it's just claimed. It's probably in the process of pulling data down. Or maybe you're gonna do a big merge. You could take it offline but leave it claimed uh, so that nobody sends queries to you at that time. And then the ephemeral online node uh, so that clients know where to come and ask information out of. So from a query perspective, what does this kind of look like? Obviously it's great if we could all just write write-only systems and never have to read out of them. Um, but, you know, we want to be useful. So the client inspects Zookeeper and sees for its key ranges uh, that it cares about what nodes are online and hosting those replicas. So if you have a particular patient and it just sits within one of those regions because we've co-located it, you only have to query one of those shards. Um, and then if you know you happen to have a large client, maybe your data is client-based, like a patient record or a population record or something like that, and that bounds two queries, then you know that your key space falls into those two regions, and you can do distributed request. And you can be, you know, as smart and as granular about where those boundaries are as you want them to be. So if you know that you want to use some feature in Solar that's not um, doesn't work for distributed then you just organize those boundaries in such a way that you only have to talk to one shard ever for them. Um, we also did the load balancing in the client, so it knows the few nodes that are serving the replicas that it cares about, uh, it just randomly picks between them. Not as great um, because it's not aware as what other clients are doing, so you don't get like round robin or least connections or anything like that, uh, but it works out pretty well and configuration is zero, no load balancer deployments. And then if a query fails, it just retries. So if you happen to have a zookeeper state that hasn't realized that something's dropped out, try to hit the server 404s uh, and you try one of the other ones. So kind of the ending thoughts around this, um, obviously keep things simple and what works for you. So if you're really good at operating HBase uh, like my team is, then that's the direction we went. If you're really good at MySQL, you could do the same sort of strategy, just pulling things off of there. So, you know, if your disaster recovery processes for solar are totally undefined, um, you know, think about it this way. Do you know how to replicate MySQL and do data center cross stuff with that? Cool, that's what you're good at, do that. So keep your touch points at a minimum. Um, variants will kill you at some point in time. And then organize your data around your queries for sure. So look at your query patterns. Uh, Dragon had an awesome talk yesterday around stuff that he built out, indexes specifically for certain queries. So that thought plays very much in mind. So uh, this is my contact info. Uh, you can find me at B under Brown on Twitter. I hardly ever tweet, but if you DM me or something like that, I'll be sure to get back to you and my LinkedIn profile. Um, 
the engineering blog at Cerner, I'll probably post about this um, in the next couple of days. I've got kind of an essay format form of it uh, with a few more details. So uh, go out there, read other stuff. There's other cool things about people are doing at Cerner. And we're hiring, obligatory comment. <laughs> they told me they wouldn't pay for my flight unless I said that. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we're hiring, we do lots of cool stuff. Um, always looking for new, interesting people. So I think that's it, I've got some bonus slides, but I'll take questions first, yeah. So the way that, um, the question was kind of around if you want to expand your cluster to so this kind of scale out in the replica direction uh, so you can get m more query throughput. Uh, in that case, we made our versions immutable. So what you can do, and we've used this a couple of times, um, is if you have a particular slice that's hotter than other ones so it's getting more queries coming through it, in that new version you create, you can actually say for this shard, I want six versions instead of two all the other shards can still be running two replicas, or two, uh, six, six replicas, sorry, instead of two on the other shards. Um, and you'll still get the auto promotion to work. So in the previous version, those two replicas that were serving that hot shard will still move forward, and four new ones will just fall right into line. So you can have kind of an unbalanced number of replicas across the shards um, just by changing the directory structure inside ZooKeeper. So the question is kind of um, between HBase and the index splits. Um, HBase kind of organizes things into regions, and then if a region gets too big data-wise, it'll split it into two. Um, we don't really connect where the HBase splits are and where the index splits are. So sometimes you do have an index kind of span, boundary span, that does cross regions. Um, it works a little bit funkier, so when it does the scan, you have to, you know, you go from part of a region to the end of the region, and then it might transition to a new machine and continue the scan. But the, the kind of HBase client simplifies that a lot, so it's really an abstraction that we don't need to worry about. Correct. Um, so the question was, what do we use to kind of determine the winner? Do we do leader election or something else? So we kind of determine that um, through the claim process, and ZooKeeper has some metaphors where you can say this node does not exist when I attempt to write to it. And so if you get three kind of nodes in the pool competing, um, they all kind of try to connect with that same thought in mind. So no, no priority at all. So one of them will win just by how ZooKeeper decides which one went first. So. I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. So it's not serving that key range already? Are you thinking about the migration path? Yeah. Okay, so the migration path happens before it becomes available to other shards, so through that watch kind of mechanism. So it publishes through the watch out to it, and then after, I think it's 10 seconds, we can figure it sort of um, inside the management uh, kind of app. It kind of publishes after that. So it gives a pause for people to migrate across before it switches it on and makes it available to the rest of the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we started writing this, um, I think it was a year and a half ago. Um, and so Solar Cloud wasn't available. Um, that's, yeah, that's been something that we've kind of always thought about as we were writing it. So are we gonna get this done before Solar Cloud hits? Is Solar Cloud gonna have the things that we want and need before it does? Um, and then you know there's the constant kind of why not just contribute to Solar Cloud and make that go faster. Um, so Cerner in the past has not been the most forgiving toward contributing to open source. Uh, that's changing. Um, hopefully at some time, I'm fighting right now, but we'll get to open source this to just have it out there. Um, but it's definitely use what works for you kind of thing. So I kind of tried to stress that in that last wrap up slide. So we're really good at HBase. Teams understand how to write to it. Um, you know, how to do consistency updates and things like that. So we just stuck with this. Um, but if you're new into things, um, you know, and Solar Cloud works for you and you've got a data set that it works at and 
you know, the shard splitting metaphors and all that kind of stuff work inside Solar Cloud, then definitely use Solar Cloud. 